It's Thursday, August 15th, 2024, and welcome back to Matters of Policy and Politics, a Hoover Institution podcast devoted to governance and balance of power here in America and around the world. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm the Hoover Institution's Virginia Hobbs Carpenter Distinguished Policy Fellow in Journalism. I'm not the only Hoover Fellow who's podcasting these days. If your intellectual curiosity gets the best of you, you should go to the Hoover Institution's website, which is hoover.org. Click on the tab at the top of the homepage that says Commentary, then head over to where it says Multimedia, and up will come the full menu of podcast, over a dozen in all, including this one. Now, today's podcast, we're going to go across the globe. We're going to examine the Middle East, and helping us to make sense of that troubled region is my colleague, Cole Bunzel. Cole's a fellow here at the Hoover Institution, a historian and Arabist. He studies the history and contemporary affairs of the Islamic Middle East with a focus on violent Islamism in the Arabian Peninsula. Cole, welcome back to the podcast. Bill, thanks for having me. So uh, there was a phrase in World War II, Cole, and it was called the Sitzkrieg. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but this refers to about an eighth month period from 1939 to 1940 when there just wasn't an all-out fight in Western Europe. There was naval action going on, but in terms of big land battle, the Nazis had not moved on Holland or Belgium or France yet. So the Sitzkrieg as opposed to a Blitzkrieg. It seems to me, Cole, that we've had something of a Sitzkrieg, if you will, the past couple of weeks in this regard. Um, on January, on July the 30th, Israeli really forces eliminated Hezbollah's top military commander in Beirut. A day later, Hamas's uh, political leader, uh, uh, Ismail Haniyeh, I apologize if I got his name wrong, Cole, uh, was killed in Tehran. All of this after Iranian-made rockets fired by Hezbollah military group landed on a soccer pitch in a Druze town in the Golan Heights on the 27th of July, killing at least a dozen youngsters, Cole. Iran said at the time that it will retaliate. Iran's Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, who is the commander of Iranian Armed Forces, uh, has both promised and reportedly agreed and lighted a response. Meanwhile, Cole Israel said it will respond in kind, even if the Iranian attack yields no casualties. So we've been sitting around for the better part of two weeks waiting for something very bad to happen in the Middle East, Cole. But yet here we are two weeks into the Sitzkrieg, if you will, and nothing's happened. Mm -hmm. Why not? Uh, well, I think it's important to go back to April, which was the last time we had a major confrontation or an impending confrontation between uh, directly between Iran and Israel. Uh, this was after uh, Israel uh, dropped a bomb. I think it was a bomb. Uh, it was an airstrike on a diplomatic compound in Damascus that was hosting uh, a number of senior Iranian generals that were responsible for paramilitary operations targeting Israel. Uh, not incidentally, uh, in in Lebanon and Syria. And so there was a major retaliation from the Iranians. Uh, it actually took about, almost two weeks to to come about. So we're kind of in the same uh, sort of territory right now of about it being a bit more than two weeks. But uh, there there is a precedent now for an, an Iranian direct strike. Of course, uh, as you remember, there were some 300 uh, missiles and drones fired directly from Iran uh, at Israel, almost all of which were intercepted by uh, is Israeli air defense and the United States, uh, as well as some of the Arab partners, uh, some of which were much quieter about their participation. And I'm referring to Saudi Arabia in particular. Right. Uh, so um, we have uh, a, a difficult situation unfolding because Iran, uh, together with Hezbollah, have threatened retaliation, but uh, Israel has in turn threatened uh, further retaliation. So uh, neither of these parties, none of these parties, wants to engage in a full-out war, certainly not Iran, uh, which knows that it doesn't have uh, the military strength of, of Israel. And uh, it is also limited in what kinds of uh, retaliation it can engage in, because it, it knows now that if it fires the kind of ordinance that it did, uh, which is you know quite a big deal for, for Iran to, to unload, uh, it, it's probably going to be intercepted. So um, it, if it it wants to kind of retain its honor, it has to do something uh, where it will be successful. And the United States, for its part, is just desperate to stave off uh, an escalatory spiral. So what they are doing right now is they've um, they basically urged uh, Israel and Hamas to come to the negotiating table in Doha, which is sort of unfolding right now. You don't have Hamas participating, but you have the CIA director there and you have Israeli officials uh, who are negotiating, um, trying to uh, cement a, a, a ceasefire and hostage release deal. Um, and the White House is hopeful that uh, this could kind of replace retaliation by Iran and Hezbollah uh, so that Ar- Iran could say, well, out of, you know, 
our our appreciation for and love for our Palestinian brothers, we're not going to um, to prevent this deal from going forward. Something like that. Now, going back to the April strike, Cole, didn't Iran kind of telegraph the um, the strikes, if you will, uh, kind of begging the question about how effective they were hoping the strikes to be? I ask this in this regard. You have kind of a game of yeah. chicken here if you're the Iranians. You, have to, you mentioned about saving face. You have to do something, I guess, for public consumption to show to show the people the regime actually will not, you know, will not tolerate this sort of strike as it occurred in Tehran. But it's playing chicken, Cole, because you don't know what the Israel what the Israelis will do in response. And I gotta believe that the Iranians, Cole, you're kind of rattled because that strike inside Tehran, that was, you know, a safe place, they thought. It was deep in the heart of Iran. And it begs the question, what all do the Israelis really know about life inside of Iran? So I kind of I know we can't get inside of the head of the Iranian leaders, but you know, I think this is a more calculated response than than people think. Yeah, it is calculated and, it, and, it, and it's different, but it's also um, different in terms of the circumstances because the in, the attack in April happened uh, directly against Iranian, senior Iranian military officials. The strike that we're talking about that, or not, it wasn't a strike, the bomb that took out Ismail Haniya, the Hamas political leader on July 31st, that was not against an Iranian target. It was against a Hamas official. Um, so there, and, and of course, Israel, which did not, publicly take credit for that assassination, has assassinated multiple uh, figures inside of Iran over the years. And that has not invited you know, the kind of retaliation uh, that we saw in last April. So it's not entirely clear that Iran uh, is going to engage in the kind of theatrics that uh, from a few months ago in terms of a response. Um, and it is noteworthy that it is not telegraphing that response in the way that it did back in April. Um, right. As you think you're suggesting, the, the United States and Israel knew kind of how to defend against this attack, sort of orchestrated in a way that um, the Iranians, I think, they, they hoped they would get some of the ordinance through. They would kill, you know, they would hit some targets. Um, they ended up hitting pretty much nothing. And so that <laughs> which they, of course, did not acknowledge. They, you know, their media says that they were actually quite successful, um, and the Israelis and the Americans were lying, um, which is typical of uh, of their media. Um, but to the kind of response now that we're looking at, um, one thing that I've noticed from uh, the White House spokesman uh, John Kirby from something he was saying today or yesterday was that uh, we aren't getting the kind of telegraphing that we got back in April, so we don't know exactly uh, what kind of um, response Iran is preparing, but we do have some sense that they are preparing, you know, kind of a, a known unknown uh, sort of a, uh, you know, discourse that we're, we're witnessing there. I maybe watch too many movies, uh, Cole, but one movie that comes to mind is The Godfather and the uh, the baptism scene where Michael Corleone uh, says he wants to, I think the phrase is, settle all family business at once, which ends to the decapitation of the various Corleone rivals, if you will. <laughs> Cole, why doesn't Israel do the same, given that it has problems in, with Hamas? It has problems with Hezbollah, problems with Iran, problems with the Houthis. Why doesn't it just settle all these things at once, or is that just too much for the Israelis to consume at one time? Well, that would be quite, um, you know, a concentration of, of military um, effort right. on all the different fronts. I think that Israel would prefer to take it, you know, one step at a time. Uh, in terms of escalation, I think the most likely, you know, uh, thing that we're, we could see isn't, I, we hear the word regional war a lot. I think that that's probably um, unlikely, it's particularly in uh, at, at the present moment, uh, it's hard to imagine the Gulf states, for instance, becoming directly involved in a war against Iran. Iran doesn't want it. The Gulf states don't want it. Um, and, and it by definition, regional war coal means multiple nations fighting yeah. all at the same time, right? Yeah. I think much more likely is what, what we would see is a direct uh, confrontation, um, escalation uh, between Hezbollah and Israel. So the uh, the Iranian proxy that controls uh, southern Lebanon that is stationed there uh, against a contrary to UN security resolution from 2006 that ended that war. It is be below the so-called uh, this um, area that is called the Litani River. And it has been uh, firing thousands of rockets since October 7th uh, at uh, Israeli population centers, and so tens of thousands of uh, Israelis have not been able to return to their homes since right. since the fall, um, and that has put a lot of pressure on Benjamin Netanyahu to to do something about this. And um, 
there have been a, there's a lot of um, noise from the Israeli security establishment that they want to go after Hezbollah. And the what I keep reading is that the best way for Israel to um, to to kind of um, to go after Hezbollah is to do it uh, in a preemptive strike, because if if you allow Hezbollah to set off, say, 6000 rockets, which is Apparently, that's the most it can do in one day. Uh, it's going to it's going to kill a lot of Israelis, including a lot of civilians. I mean, right. these are um, these are uh, just rockets. They don't have you know targeting um, you know devices on them, but they they're going to land in a lot of places, and it, that's going to make uh, things very difficult for Israel. But if you um, if you preempt by going directly on the on the offensive, uh, you're it's much more likely that you can take out. Uh, a lot of of Hezbollah's uh, rocket capability. So I think m- that's the most likely uh, form of escalation that we could see, um, particularly if there isn't a uh, a ceasefire agreement uh, reached in Doha this week, which I'm not particularly optimistic about, but uh, we shall see. Well, let's shift to let's talk about that. So as you mentioned, there was a meeting today in Doha in uh, Qatar. Uh, Qatari, Egyptian, U.S. officials were present. I believe an, an Israeli delegation attended, uh, but as you mentioned, Hamas did not participate directly. Uh, back in May, Cole, uh, President Biden laid out a three-phase program uh, for the Middle East. Phase one, uh, he said, would last six weeks. It called for the withdrawal of Israeli forces from populated areas of Gaza, uh, the release of a number of hostages, including women, the elderly, the wounded, in exchange for the release of hundreds of Palestinian prisoners uh, and the implementation of a temporary truce. Phase two under the Biden plan allowed for a, quote, exchange for the release of all remaining living hostages, including male soldiers, and a permanent end to fighting. And then the third phase, uh, phase coal reconstruction plan for Gaza would commence. Any final remains of hostages who have been killed to be returned to families. And there you are. So mm-hmm. what's going to happen with this program? Is can any of this see the light of day or is this thing, is this not going to happen? Well, it, it's interesting just uh, to begin with that President Biden even outlined this plan back in May. Um, it's He kind of outlined it as if it were his proposal. It was actually an Israeli proposal or a counter proposal that was part of an ongoing back and forth between Hamas and right. uh, and Israel. And it was seized on by President Biden as, you know, this, you know, here is a, finally an opportunity to end this war. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what he did was, I think he... He represented stage two of this deal uh, in a way that Israel didn't didn't like. So he basically said that um, according to the plan, as it had been laid out, it, as long as negotiations continued between Hamas and Israel, the ceasefire would remain in place. Uh, mm-hmm. Israel and Netanyahu in particular, uh, he ba- he responded by saying that's not really what the deal says. It says uh, I mean, we we reserve the right to continue to uh, engage in this war whenever uh, whenever we whenever we want after the six week uh, period. So Hamas for its part has been saying we don't want to um, engage in any kind of temporary ceasefire. We want a permanent ceasefire and that's the only ceasefire that we're going to um, to entertain. Uh, Israel has said that they want to um, you know to follow this plan. Uh, Netanyahu has said that he is not uh, altering any part of the plan that, that was set out back in May. Uh, but there are certain clarifications that this is the term that I see in Israeli media um, that have been sought. So Israel, for instance, does not want to relinquish control over what is known as the Philadelphia Corridor, which is the uh, the area um, that is the border border region between Gaza and Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, it's very important uh, for Israel because this is an area where uh, there have been lots of tunnels. This is where all the smuggling of weapons and uh, and in military personnel uh, is 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 taking place, uh, and Israel has just been astounded to find uh, even more tunnels, uh, massive tunnels where you you could drive trucks through, uh, that even more than it, it expected and anticipated. Uh, so it's not interested in, in giving that up. Um, in that, there's no mention of of that in the in the di- in the text of the deal. That it, you know, it does say that Israel has to withdraw essentially from all of Gaza, all populated areas. Israel also, as part of one of his uh, clarifications, doesn't want to relinquish control of something that's called the Netzarim Corridor or Axis, which is an area that bisects Gaza, um, kind of in the middle of Gaza. It's the area that separates uh, the south from the north. And part of their their rationale for this is that, according to the deal, 
um, Israeli civilians are, excuse me, Palestinian civilians in Gaza are supposed to be able to return to their homes in northern Gaza. But mm -hmm. Israel wants to basically check them uh, for weapons to make sure that they're that this area remains demilitarized. Um, that's what they, even though the, the deal doesn't quite say demilitarized, but it does say that people should be screened for for weapons. Uh, and so these are just kinds of sticking points between between the two parties. And you combine that with the um, the disagreement over what what really phase two consists of, right. um, and and you get to I think this this stalemate that we're still in, and combine that even further with the fact that um, Ismail Haniya, who had been the the political head of Hamas, has now been replaced by the man who's kind of the the man on the spot, uh, uh, Yahya Sinwar, the a very recalcitrant leader in Gaza, the military leader of Gaza, uh, and, and I think you're in a situation where. Um, <laughs> the the likelihood of a deal being struck and you know there being balloons and parades over how how great this uh the ceasefire is uh, it just doesn't seem very likely in my eyes unfortunately we'll get to more mr sidmore in a moment cole but let's uh let's continue here with the um with the with these negotiations uh two questions one why is hamas not attending and b why bother to have this if hamas is not attending <laughs> yeah, well, um, I think John Kirby said, well, this isn't the first time that Hamas hasn't attended. So I mean, they, they say they're not attending, but the Qataris are attending sort of in their in their stead. And um, I think it just slows down negotiations. One of the, the reasons um, that was given by Hamas is that they, they don't see any reason to participate in, yeah, in any further negotiations with Israel if Israel isn't putting forward a serious uh, you know, position that is a position that they're um, that, that Hamas is willing to to entertain, um, and also I think that this this does relate back to to Yahya Sinwar being in charge of uh, of Hamas. He has said, uh, according to uh, something that was in the New York Times yesterday, uh, that he he thinks that the only way that uh, negotiations would be uh, helpful in the first place would be if there's already a ceasefire in place. So ceasefire negotiations for him seem to have to begin with a ceasefire, uh, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so Hamas doesn't want to participate, but I, I think unfortunately what that kind of demonstrates is that it's the international community, it's the United States, it's uh, it's the Arab partners of Egypt and Qatar. They're all really pressing for this deal. Israel is, you know, they're engaged in the conversation, but Hamas is the one that is going to be uh, difficult to even get in the room and more, even more difficult to to get to an actual agreement. From Hamas's standpoint, Cole, is there symbolic value in not participating in the negotiations? In other words, being able to say to your your brothers in the Middle East that we're not being forced in negotiations, the United States doesn't dictate terms to us, we will decide what is best to us on our own on our own timetable, our own schedule. Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think I think they're also trying to to just uh, you know, demonstrate a certain resilience, a defiance, uh, and that 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 goes back to the fact that their the, their leader, the political leader of Hamas, uh, Ismail Haniyeh, was just assassinated allegedly by Israel uh, in Tehran. So, I mean, you can imagine if you were Hamas, that uh, that would tick you off, and you would not want to uh, be in the same room or building with the the people responsible for murdering your colleague um yeah so that yeah, theatrics are certainly part of it all right let's talk a little bit about yaha uh, sidwar uh, he was appointed a political head uh, of hamas after the uh, hanye assassination i think his title technically is political chief at large um he was born in a refugee camp in southern gaza he is one of the founders of hamas's military wing uh, he has spent a very large chunk of his life in Israeli prisons. Uh, he is a rare Hamas leader who is fluent in Hebrew. Um, he is a militant figure, an enforcer inside Hamas. Um, question for you, Cole. Uh, Al Jazeera, I was reading a piece about him in Al Jazeera of all places, and Al Jazeera called this a defiant choice. Would you agree with that characterization? Is this a defiant choice? Yeah, I, I think it is a defiant choice. Um, you know, Hamas had been sort of like you know, Iran in, in the way that it has in the different kinds of leaders for different settings. Mm -hmm. So you know, Iran has had Javad Sarif in the past as the, um, I think, the foreign minister who is kind of, he puts on, you know, a smiling face. He can communicate with the West. And then inside Iran, uh, you have Khamenei, who is, you know, more of a defiant voice. So you had this kind of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde 
uh, thing going on. Uh, Hamas had a similar thing. Ismail Haniya you know, is a more you know, palatable figure. You could talk uh, to Western uh, officials, including the head of the CIA. And uh, inside Gaza, you had a more ruthless individual like Yahya Sinwar, who is known, you know, he really, uh, you could say, a tough uh, um bad guy uh, somebody who is known to have strangled uh, people to death uh, as part of his his earlier career as um head of uh Gaza internal not Gaza uh, Hamas internal security and was serving four life sentences um so not a good not a good individual um I'm forgetting what the question was actually I think I'm, I I moved on to a little far well, about it being um, a defined choice, but here's what yeah. interests me. He is a political leader, a political chief at large, as they call it. Can he think strategically? Because a political leader needs to think strategically. He needs to be thinking, as in chess, a couple steps ahead. Is he is he that kind of thinker? Well, I, I think that he is somebody who's very much wedded to um, kind of an originalist Hamas ideology, which is, uh, the, which is a view that Israel doesn't have any right to exist in any form. Um, the, the land on which Israel uh, exists is occupied Palestinian land, every single inch of it. Uh, there can therefore be no you know, talk of two-state solution. Um, there can only be resistance. Uh, we can have truces, perhaps, uh, but everything will ultimately lead to the uh, elimination of Israel, uh, driving the Jews off of the land, uh, that sort of thing. I mean, he is much, very much um, committed to that worldview. And um, I think that October 7th, which he is known to have been basically the mastermind of, uh, was the demonstration of that worldview. And he wasn't going to, he wasn't satisfied being the, the leader of Hamas in Gaza, just with sort of, you know, building uh, a an economy and a society uh, with Gulf money. This is kind of Netanyahu's idea, okay? And, and and to some extent, the, our Gulf allies, we're going to give them, you know, funding, um, they're going to create an economy, and ultimately, they'll, you know, they'll become more, more pacified. Uh, that was the opposite of what Yahya Sinwar wanted. He was determined by uh, the attack on um, October 7th last year, uh, to, I think, to end that sort of um, experiment in, in Hamas governance in Gaza and return to um return to defiance, return to, to militancy. And um, so to the extent that he's thinking strategically, that's his strategy. And unfortunately, it's not a strategy. It's not a face that, that the West, that the United States can really work with uh, if we're trying to you know, come to any kind of resolution to, to this war. You know, Cole, there is a uh, interesting historical parallel back here in the United States, and that would be the Camp David summit of uh, 2000, um, I think July the 11th, the 15th of that year, final year of Bill Clinton's presidency. Um, Yasser Arafat was uh, part of the negotiations. The Clinton administration spun this as trying to avoid bloodshed in the region because uh, Arafat had said that he would declare statehood in September, and they thought all hell would break loose if he did that. Um, but with six months to go in his presidency, Bill Clinton was looking at a couple of things. He was looking at, first of all, legacy. Uh, presidents always smell a Nobel Peace Prize, and I think he fell, fell prey to that as well. And also some people tell you that he was looking for some sort of personal atonement for the uh, Monica Lewinsky scandal as well. He wanted to go out on a high note, if you will. Um, I mentioned this, Cole, because there was a story that uh, went around um, a few months after Clinton left office, and it goes something like this. About three days after Clinton stepped out of office, he got a phone call from Yasser Arafat, just Arafat thanking him for his presidency. And the story goes like this, Cole Arafat told Clinton, quote, you're a great man, to which Clinton responded, the hell I am, and Clinton <laughs> read it on a fossil failure, and you made me one. Right. Uh, the problem was that Clinton desperately wanted to get some sort of agreement out of that July summit at Camp David, and he ran into a brick wall in the form of Yasser Arafat. Clinton suggested the problem, Cole, was that Arafat was simply too old. He was 71 years old at the time and too set in his ways to do a complicated peace deal. And that's why I bring up Sawar and his age. Yeah, I think he's born in 1962, so he's not a youngster necessarily. He's not a, he's not a, you no. know, Marian, but he's not a kid either. But again, the question is, can someone like Sidwar, can people, is there any evidence within the Hamas world that Hamas can actually do a peace deal? Or is this just, I'm sorry, all for public consumption? So you did have, after, after October 7th, um, serious analysts of the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, writing um, from their sources reports about 
there being internal conflicts within Hamas. Uh, mm -hmm. There were certain voices, uh, including Ismail Haniya, who maybe were not uh, so adamant about this, this new posture of defiance that was represented by October 7th. Um, and pu publicly, Hamas officials were all you know, supporting and cheering uh, the massacre of October 7th, but uh, inside um, there was concern that this was actually going to lead to the undoing of Hamas' permanent state of war, uh, Israel retaliating and killing, um, demolishing Gaza, um, and which is kind of what we're seeing. Um, but what seems to have happened is that um, a lot of those voices have just been muffled and they've, they've lost uh, any sort of influence, in part because um, while you had these negotiations going on in Qatar with Hamas representatives who live in these villas in Qatar and they're very wealthy and they're living a, you know, a nice life, um, inside Gaza, they had absolutely no uh, influence over Yahya Sinwar. He called all the shots. He was effectively uh, the only voice that mattered. And so by pointing him as the political head of Hamas, they're sort of just, you know, making reality uh, official. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's one way of looking at it. So unfortunately, Hamas has become, uh, if there were more moderate voices inside Hamas, and mo moderate is, of course, you know, very relative in that, in that setting, um, they have basically lost their their influence. So I think what, what we're seeing, I mean, and compared to Yasser Arafat, I mean, Yasser Arafat is like Gandhi compared to, to Yahya Sinwar. I mean, Yahya Sinwar has absolutely no interest whatsoever in negotiating a two-state solution. I, I mean, the only possible outcome that would satisfy Yahya Sinwar would be, you know, the Jews leaving and, 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 uh, and, and Hamas taking over all of, uh, as they they see it, historic Muslim Palestine. Mm -hmm. Is it a good thing, Cole, to be pressing for uh, negotiations and a peace when your administration has five months and one week to go? Today is August the fifteenth, and five months and one week from from now, Joe Biden is no longer president of the United States. Um, I ask because if you are one of the negotiating parties, if you're Hamas, if you're Israel, the Saudis, who we'll get to in a minute, uh, with uh, the mega deal uh, between Israel and Saudi Arabia, you have to be thinking in the back of your mind. You know, what changes in America six months from now? There may be a new administration. They may be more friendly to us. They may be more hostile. In other words, is when America is in the middle of an election, is that a good time to be trying to broker peace in the Middle East? I think it's particularly difficult right now for, for Joe Biden. I think he's perceived as a lame duck president. Uh, it's very interesting that Netanyahu visited Washington. Um, and I think within a, within a week, uh, Netanyahu goes back and he assassinates the second uh, leader of Hezbollah and the political leader of of, uh, of Hamas in, in about a 10-hour stretch, um, which probably wasn't a, a part of the discussion between Netanyahu and Joe Biden, if I had to imagine. So Biden doesn't, I mean, uh, Netanyahu doesn't feel constrained, it seems, by, by Biden. Um, he's probably hopeful that, uh, that Trump will be reelected. Um, now, Hamas, if you're Hamas, uh, you could imagine that maybe you feel the opposite, that if, if Trump is reelected, then you're going to have a more difficult position because uh, Trump might say, you know, uh, to hell with Gaza, you know, finish the job. I'm not going to worry about you know, humanitarian it concerns. Um, and so it, it is difficult. I, I don't fault the administration for trying, of course. I think that, you know, it, it's the right thing to be doing. Um I'm not sure they're going about it the right way. I don't think the publicly, you know, putting pressure on uh, on our ally Israel, and uh, which I think was part of the whole um, uh, theatrics of the May 31st Biden speech. Uh, if we go back in, in time, that that was necessarily helpful. Um, but uh, we are where we are, and um, this is what we're doing. Let's talk about the uh, so-called mega deal between Israel and Saudi Arabia uh, and the question whether or not it's still on the table, Cole. Um, the mega deal is, I understand it, Cole, correct me if I'm wrong, um, a package of agreements between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, which leads to a question which I want you to address about uh, how to get around this if it's not a uh, treaty. And I think the answer is you're going to point me to Bahrain. Yeah. Um, the second uh, part is a normalization of relations, uh, and the third uh, pathway to a Palestinian state. And according to a State Department spokesman, quote, all of them are linked together. So first of all, getting back to our question of negotiations, is this in play right now? Is this viable? Uh, well, we should, you know, if we go back to October 6th, this, this, th this idea of a Saudi normalization uh, with Israel in return for certain uh, benefits, uh, between 
uh, fr- from Washington forward at the Saudis. This was very much in play. It was something that the Saudis were were very much um, interested in, hosting lots of pro-Israel you know, delegations, uh, Jewish groups, um, you know, congressmen. And there was a lot of momentum behind it. And um, it was essentially, you know, taken off the table, at least temporarily by, by October 7th. And Saudi Arabia reverted to its, you know, its kind of, natural uh, position of criticizing uh, Israel and settlements and occupation, et cetera, um, as kind of the root cause behind what Hamas did on October 7th. So there hasn't been a lot of of momentum on this. And we've also heard that um, kind of the price now in terms of what the Saudis would like to see in terms of um, a a kind of Palestinian state or something along those lines has been raised. So before October 7th, it was um, it was sort of leaked in, in the press that the Saudis, you know, they they didn't really care that much about you know what the Palestinians got. They they weren't going to condition this mega deal on Palestinian uh, statehood, uh, but they wanted there to be at least some some kind of um, something in the agreement that would you know make them be able to save face and say, look, we got this, you know, maybe to say we got Israel to take off. Um, uh, annexing the West Bank as part of an agreement, something like that. But now uh, the Saudis are very much adamant that there be a an Israeli commitment to a pathway to a Palestinian state, which isn't doesn't even sound like very much, right? You're just saying we commit as Israel to a pathway to a Palestinian state uh, to exist side by side with an Israeli state. Uh, but Netanyahu, um, given what's going on with Israeli politics and the status of his coalition, which includes two very far right Israeli ministers, uh, Betzalel Smotrich and Ben Gavir, um, he can't even utter the words Palestinian state. Uh, so the Saudis, um, to, to my you know, somewhat surprise, uh, they haven't taken the idea of the mega deal entirely off the table since October 7th. They have been uh, saying that you know, we are still you know, interested in a possible deal of normalizing relations with Israel in return for the goodies that you mentioned from Washington, you know, a, uh, a security agreement, help with a nuclear, a civil nuclear uh, um, program, things like that. Um, and just uh, yesterday, there was there were these stories that MBS, the uh, the effective leader of Saudi Arabia, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, um, who's known as MBS yeah, in the press, that he's kind of fearful of his life. He thinks that if he normalizes relations uh, with Israel, he might end up like Anwar Sadat did after this, the Egyptian president who was ultimately assassinated after making peace with Israel in, in the early 1980s, um, which you know, one can sympathize with him. Um, so, but but I mean, even though it's not technically off the table right now, uh, I think for all intents and purposes, Saudi Arabia isn't, um, isn't going to kind of make this a priority. Uh, it doesn't make, doesn't make sense to, to the Saudis to do that. Um, and also, given the state of Israeli politics, uh, it's difficult for there to be any kind of an agreement because uh, Saudi Arabia needs the, the Israeli leader to say Palestinian state, and they're just not going to, you just can't do it. Now, a, a bilateral uh, U.S. Saudi um, treaty call would require 67 votes to the Senate. And I think Lindsey Graham, the Republican senator from South Carolina, said it's not going to happen. And Senator Grant's pretty good at counting votes. So I think we could agree that there would not be an actual treaty. But there's a way around this. And here I turn your attention, Cole, to what is called a comprehensive security and prosperity agreement. And this was the phrase used uh, when the United States and Bahrain entered to an agreement, I believe in September, but shortly before October 7th. Can you tell us a little bit about what we did with regard to Bahrain, which is important, I guess, because it hosts the U.S. Uh, Fifth Fleet and is also headquarters of uh, U.S. Naval Forces Central Command? Well, I, I don't know the the nitty gritty of, of that, that arrangement, but I, most of what I've read about what the Saudis are interested in is they want a an actual treaty agreement, like what we have with Japan and South Korea, something that binds the uh, the United States to the security of Saudi Arabia uh, in a way that it gets gets out of electoral politics. Well, are they um, are they looking for what's well, it's called it's called an Article Five, I believe. That's after yeah. NATO. In other words, is that what they're looking for? An Article Five. Well, I think it could be possibly something short of that. Um, when you look at those those treaties with with South Korea and Japan, it doesn't uh, the language doesn't come 
to, isn't quite on the level of Article Five with NATO, um, but they want there to be um, they want they want the Senate to ratify something with with them. That is part of the the whole arrangement um, that I, as far from my discussions with with officials there, um, that that's what they're interested in. And one of the ways that they were hoping to obtain this was to have their the the treaty that the Senate would ratify. And I'm with you and I'm with, or I, I suspect I'm with you and, and Lindsey Graham and being a little skeptical about their, the possibility of getting to 67 votes. But the idea would be that the, um, the, the treaty would also include Israel so that you would have the vote being on security bilateral uh, relationships with Israel and Saudi Arabia in one go and possibly in that way you could get the votes. But uh, given the popularity or lack thereof uh, of Saudi Arabia in the Senate, uh, particularly among Democrats, it, it's pretty hard to imagine uh, us getting to that. I would say at least two headwinds, Cole. One is the question of human rights, which was an issue with Bahrain, which uh, the U.S. had to dance around and do in that agreement. But the other one that doesn't get a lot of attention is Saudi uranium enrichment. Uh, yeah. I mean, the Saudis are interested in um, in a oh, nuclear wow. program. I mean, and if you were Saudi Arabia, you probably would be too, because you're right across the Persian Gulf from Iran, which has, um, you know, a, a sprawling nuclear agree- nuclear program. Um, they are, uh, for all intents and purposes, right now a um, a threshold nuclear power. And you know, every every month, every year, they're becoming even more of a threshold nuclear power, and with the capability to sprint to uh, to a bomb in multiple locations. So. That scares the Saudis. Um, they've told our, our Western counterparts that if they get a bomb, we're going to get a bomb. Um, and we'd rather be in partnership with you in terms of uh, nuclear uh, enrichment and having a you know an, an approved program that you can oversee and help us with. Uh, and ideally, that wouldn't include any kind of military component because Iran won't get the bomb. Uh, but they want they want nuclear uh, enrichment and. Um, it's hard hard to blame them for that. Okay, let's end on a couple of questions. First question, Cole, as I mentioned, uh, what, four months in a week or five months in a week until the administration is over. Does Joe Biden get a ceasefire in the Middle East and does he get a lasting ceasefire? Uh, if I had to, to bet on it, I would say no. No, no and uh, no? Uh, no, no and no. I, I think that Hamas, I mean, <laughs> predictions in the Middle East are, are, are you know, a game that you don't really want to get into if, if you want to if you want a successful career uh, in uh, in the think tank world. So, um, you know, I think it, or or in in policy, I think it was just a couple of weeks before October seventh that National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan was praising his administration for having the calmest situation in the Middle East that he, there had been in, in decades. Uh, we saw how that turned out. So, uh, I mean, you never know. Um, Yahya Sinwar could. He may very well say, you know what, um, I'm losing right now and we need it. We need calm. I'm going to agree to, to Israel's conditions and we're going to have this stupid ceasefire and I'll break it. I'll break the conditions when I feel like it. I mean, that's perfectly possible. Um, but I think that you know, from Hamas's perspective, what, what they're very concerned about is they have these hostages. They have over 100 hostages. Uh, now they probably only have 50 to 75 who are still alive. Um, but a lot of them are women and children and the elderly, and Israel wants those back. And so in the first phase of the proposed deal, uh, Israel gets back the women, the children, the elderly. Um, those are, of course, the most va- from Hamas's perspective, the most valuable um, hostages. Um, and so they don't want to you know, relinquish that card. And it makes a lot of sense for them to say no and to wait until they get a better deal, possibly with, say, a uh, Kamala Harris administration that is, you know, um, a lot more, um, let's say, uh, intolerant of, of Israeli, uh, you know, military operations in Gaza. So that could be uh, his calculation. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Second question, Cole, uh, is an Israeli conflict with Hezbollah inevitable or avoidable? Uh, it's, that's tough. Um, it, it's hard to, to kind of entertain this reality that we're that we're in right now kind of lasting forever um it's 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 a real um, stain on Netanyahu's legacy right now that uh, tens of thousands of Israelis can't return to their homes in the north right. and 
that situation has to be reversed. Now, it could effectively be reversed with ceasefire in Gaza because Hezbollah says we will stop firing rockets if there's a ceasefire. Um, so that possibility is certainly there. Uh, however, if we don't, if we months and months continue to pass and we don't get a ceasefire and we still have these exchange of, um, of military confrontations between Israel and Hezbollah, you can also imagine uh, Israel saying to hell with it, we need to uh, we need to go on the offensive. We need to eliminate the threat and uh, allow our people to return to their homes. And that's what the Israeli security establishment seems to be set on. So um, looking into, over the horizon the next year or two, I, I would expect there to be uh, a larger war there. That would be my prediction. <laughs> Question three, the eventual outcome of the mega deal. So what is the mega deal again? It's uh, the U.S. and Saudi Arabia in a bilateral treaty. It is a uh, normalization relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel and a pathway to a Palestinian state. Are all three doable, Cole, or would you just pick one or two out of that? And if so, which ones would you pick? I I'm not sanguine about this deal at all, unfortunately. I think that the, the conditions are just not right for it. Um, so long as there is this ongoing confrontation in Gaza, any any kind of normalization agreement between Saudi Arabia and Israel makes MBS look bad. Uh, he's concerned about his popularity. He's concerned about his life. Um, and you know, just given the state of Israeli politics, as I said before, it, it's hard for um, as long as this current government exists in Israel. I don't think that there can be a, a mega deal um, unless the the far right ministers that I referred to before, um, you know, act somehow say okay let's agree to uh, a pathway to a palestinian state state wink wink you know fingers crossed we don't really care um you know there's there's that possibility okay final question cold it has to do with you you're an arabist so you read things that i don't read that i can't read just walk us through what you read every day from the middle east and perhaps you can give a few uh, give us a couple reading selections places you go in, in english not arabic Oh, well, I read a lot of things that are, you know, um, that, that bring the FBI to my house occasionally. <laughs> so um, I spent a lot of time, and that's not a joke, actually, um, which I can talk about if you, if you want. Um, yeah, so I, for, for the last, you know, decade or more, um, I have been a close follower of, um, of militant Islamist media uh, on the app known as Telegram, which is kind of a jihadi haven. So I follow. I have a fake uh, account, and I follow uh, all sorts of, you know, ISIS and Al Qaeda channels and groups, and um, as well as Hamas channels and groups. And so I, I look at what people are writing on those every day. It includes Al Qaeda media, ISIS media, um, you know, Hamas Muslim Brotherhood. So you know, just before coming on here, I was looking at what Hamas um, political officials were were writing on Telegram to see. You know, how are they were reacting to the first day of the Doha um, negotiations, which, you know, surprisingly, they they didn't reject uh, entirely. So that's the kind of thing I read, um, kind of not necessarily first thing in the morning, but there you have that. And then I look at a lot of uh, Saudi media, like Al Arabiya, Shark al Ausat. These are sort of the leading um, Saudi newspapers. Um, the the media world in, in Arabic is, you know, if you think of, um, you know, there's a rivalry in in English between the New York Times editorial page and the Wall Street Journal editorial page. That that sort of cleavage is mirrored between Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya. Al Jazeera is a Qatari you know, pro Hamas, uh, pro resistance uh, outlet, news outlets, very popular. Al Arabiya is its counterpart. It's it's pro kind of the United States um, status quo, uh, you know, um, Saudi Arabia, UAE, um, that that type of arrangement. So, um, you know, the media world is, you know, it's it's an interesting world in Arabic, certainly, uh, uh, as it is in English, of course, as well. And uh, where in English language media would you turn people to read? Uh, do you have a preferred columnist you follow? Are there certain publications that do a better job than others in terms of covering the region? Just covering the region, um, I mean, you, you really have to, to look at all the major newspapers, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Financial Times, um, Bloomberg does a lot of good work, uh, What's um, sometimes Arab News, which is a Saudi uh, English newspaper, 
Um, Times of Israel is a very good, that's probably, in my opinion, the best uh, Israeli uh, newspaper to, to follow. I go to that every day, certainly. Um, but yeah, it there's a lot out there. Good. Well, Cole, I think that kind of covers the waterfront or the, or the Middle East, I should say, the landscape there. Uh, it just never gets better, does it? Oh, uh, hopefully brighter days ahead. Okay. Cool. Again, I enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us today, and uh, hopefully not too many more uh, phone calls or raids from the FBI in your future. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. I've been listening to Matters of Policy and Politics, a Hoover Institution podcast devoted to governance and balance of power here in America and around the globe. If you've been enjoying this podcast, please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to our show. And if you wouldn't mind, please spread the word. Tell your friends about us. The Hoover Institution has Facebook, Instagram, and X feeds. Our X handle is at Hoover Inst. That's spelled H-O-O-V-E-R-I-N-S-T. Cole Bunzel, brave man that he is, is on social media. His X handle is at Cole Bunzel. That's spelled C-O-L-E-B-U-N-C-E-L, at Cole Bunzel. I mentioned our website beginning of the show, that's hoover.org. While you're there, you should sign up for the Hoover Daily Report, which keeps you updated on what Cole and his Hoover colleagues are up to. That's emailed to you weekdays. You should also sign up for Hoover's Pod Blast, which delivers the best of our podcasts each month to your inbox. For the Hoover Institution, this is Bill Whalen. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Till next time, take care. Thanks for listening. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we generate and promote ideas advancing freedom. For more information about our work, to hear more of our podcasts or view our video content, please visit hoover.org.